relationship between the police officers and the ninth, this group of police officers, and the drug dealers of the community were that close that they would hang out and discuss these kind of matters? Yeah, well, it was, it was like a clique. It was a crew. It was a group. These guys, uh, they were pretty well managed. Except that this crew you get referring to include not only cops, but cops and drug dealers? Correct. They, they worked in harmony. Without one, you couldn't have the other, because a lot of times some of the drug dealers, uh, while these guys are uniform, would go leave my shop, purchase product or get product, come back to the shop, and the cops would do it if the cops didn't bring it themselves. Uh, You've made several references this, uh, this afternoon to drug dealers telling you things, giving you information. Why would the drug dealers ever share this information with you? I, I had close ties to the community. Uh, one of the things that I did were to help uh, the drug dealers not get busted by cops by building reinforcement situations, but at the same time, the drug dealers saw these cops in my shop a lot, and they knew I had some sort of influence with one or two of them, and they would ask me to put in a word so they wouldn't get hit. And by hit, you mean what? Uh, ripped off. Either busted or ripped off, or just ripped off, or, you know, given a black and blue lesson, or depends what the situation is. Every instance is different. And by a black and blue lesson, you mean what? A beating. Yeah, that's... And it's a term, a term that they use often. Uh, a black and blue discussion was a beating that they usually gave. A black and blue discussion was right. a beating. And whose term of art was that? S excuse me, I heard a couple of officers use that phrase. Was there any other information that you had about acts of corruption that police officers were engaging in the 9th Precinct? Uh, yes. Uh, some of it uh, to do with uh, the dealers, some of it to do with them informing the dealers that uh, the TNT was in the area, some of it uh, being that uh, they would go to certain stores that they knew were selling drugs, and there were also safe havens such as my shops. I mean... So they were leaking information, you mean? Correct. And what kind of information? Some of the former officers from the 9th Precinct had, had gone into the TNT squad. And when those squads were about to hit areas of the 9th Precinct, they would get in touch with uh, some of the officers that used to hang out in my store. And those officers would, in turn, uh, tell their friends, uh, look, keep it cool tonight, don't have much shit, you know, or send a, a dumb guy in there with a little bit of product in case you get hit. And by TNT, could you tell us what you mean? Tactical, tactical narcotics team. Do you have any knowledge of what these police officers were getting in return for the information they were sharing with people on the street? Uh, a lot of times free drugs, a lot of times money, a lot of times uh, hookups. There was a lot of trading and bartering of different things. Guns, cocaine, I mean, it was very frequent to do a favor for a dealer and get drugs, especially they all like to use. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing more than getting a free passe, as they called it. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty powerful statements you just made. I'd like to ask again what your personal <coughs> basis of knowledge is for the fact, or for, your, for what you've just said, that these police officers were leaking information to drug dealers and others in the community. Uh, I've been there. I've seen them. I've, I've, spoke, I've spoke to some of the officers that were even on TNT that have come by in another car, spoke to some of the officers that were hanging out of my shop. Then they go by, and then the guy says, uh, we got to watch out for this sector, we got to watch out for this. They're going to come here, et cetera, et cetera. So you'd overhear it in the shop? Excuse me? You'd say you're over, you would overhear this in your shop? Yeah, they would tell it to me as a part of a boast. I mean, oh, just, you I know. See. It was common to, to get the information and say, oh, we have to warn this one, we have to warn that one. But you said before, as part of a boast. Could you explain what you mean by that? Well, they always wanted to seem, you know, real superior, and as though they, they ran the area, they ruled the streets. So in doing so, they had to exert their power, you know, and to help a drug dealer out, that, means, that meant the drug dealer owed them a favor, especially if it was a tight buddy of theirs, which they had many. Now, was this a common practice? Yes, ma'am. Based on your personal knowledge? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever have any contact with these police officers that would hang out in your shop, outside of your shop? Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us about that, please? Uh, at times, they would drive me to locations where I had jobs. 
at times they would drive me to locations where I had job sites or they would pick me up from job sites or they would see me in the street and I'd get into the to the vehicle, the RLP, and we'd hang out, you know, drink a couple of beers, do a couple of lines of coke, uh, different occasions, different situations. So police officers, while they were on duty in their RMP, would pick you up, drive around with you in the car? Correct. And on occasion, you're saying you do lines of coke in the RMP? Yeah, they usually have a dollar set up with another dollar rolled up into a straw, and then we'd pass it around. With how many police officers did you ever engage in the use of cocaine in an RMP? Uh, three that I know of. Three personally yeah, that you were involved with? Three that I could with? name by name, yes. I'd like to ask you I believe not there to were, name any names I believe today. there were more, but to my recollection, there was three that I recall, three okay. that stand out. I just want to remind you that we want no testimony today based on speculation. Everything you're testifying about can only be on personal knowledge, unless we make that clear Good beforehand. Enough. Were these police officers doing anything else in their RMPs? Uh, drinking. Uh, drinking? Just, yeah. They, they'd either drink beer or alcohol, uh, liquor. Uh, what they used to do sometimes is, like with beer, they had these skins that had like Coca-Cola or Pepsi on the outside. And these skins are very comfortably wrapped around the beer can. And so then they could actually be drinking beer and brought, you know, in front of people with commanders, etc. No one would know the difference. And no one would know. And was that a common occurrence that police officers while on duty would drink beers with some kind of a seal? Yes. They, they had uh, obtained these skins at some police function, and it seemed that all the officers had them. Mm -hmm. And it seemed that uh, many of the units that I see, many of the officers that I see, I see them with these, uh, the beer cans with the outside skin. How many police officers do you have personal knowledge of that would drink on duty in their patrol cars? About 12. About 12, yeah. and that's based on your personal knowledge? Personal knowledge. Uh, and were they drinking to a state of or of intoxication? Uh, a lot of times, yes. And a lot they, of times you could see it. A lot of times they used to race the RMPs just to race them, you know. Just shoot, to race them while yeah. they were on duty? Shoot down uh, Houston to come up D Street and back and see how long they take to go a 14 square block uh, perimeter. They ever seem concerned that someone might see them racing in the streets in the 9th Precinct while under the influence of alcohol? No, they pretty much, they pretty much were assured that uh, they weren't going to get bothered. Right. Most of the cops knew what they were up to and, and nobody messed with them. What do you mean nobody messed with them? Nobody messed with them. The, the, the neighborhood never messed with them and the other police uh, look the other way or were involved. Before we turn to the next segment of your testimony, I just want to refer back to a reference you made before about guns. Do you have any knowledge of police officers engaging in any corrupt activities in connection with guns? Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us about that? Uh, two on personal knowledge and one on an officer's admission. Uh, once I seen one officer give a gun to my coworker, who had he taken off of a drug dealer and had no use for it. And another time I saw another officer sell a gun to another officer. And it was supposed to be a good throw gun, a good uh, piece. And by a good throw gun you mean what? It was small enough to conceal that if in case they ever got in a situation where the perpetrator needed to have a gun on them, this gun would be easily accessible to put on the perpetrator. It was a small, uh, like a 25 or something to that nature. It was a small gun, I remember it. It was silver with pearl handle. Mm -hmm. And that these police officers would then steal these guns and either give them to other officers, or you're saying resell them to dealers on the street? Yes. Was that a common occurrence, do you know? Uh, to my knowledge, yes. It was very common. A lot of times they didn't keep but only one dirty piece in their possession. I'm sorry? I said it was, it was known to me that they only kept about one dirty piece on their possession or close to them. Mm -hmm. Usually they would find some way to dispose of it by either giving it away or trading it in for a favor or selling it or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And during the two years that these police officers were engaged in the acts that you just discussed, did the police officers ever seem concerned that a supervisor or anyone within the department would ever ask them what they were doing? 
No, they seemed to know who was coming, when they were coming, and they had it pretty well arranged. I'd like to turn to another area now. Have you ever had any contact with the Internal Affairs Division of the New York City Police Department? Yes, I have. Could you tell us about that? Could you tell us about your experiences with IED, briefly? Uh, initially, in 91, I had given an allegation to IED about a homicidal cop in the 7th Precinct. And they, uh, they returned it, the allegation as, as though it was frivolous, as though it, it, was, it didn't exist, as I was making it up. You know, here's another guy just bullshitting to make his way. And uh, that didn't turn out to be the case. Would be, what do you mean it didn't turn out to be the case? Well, uh, after IED dismissed the case as unfounded, et cetera, uh, the FIAU unit, uh, a detective and a sergeant came up to me and another person I was working with and uh, asked me for the details to that. And IED said there was no such officer FIU found within 24 hours, they found a picture, a name, the whole works. They gave me a one out of six uh, pick out, and I picked the guy right out. So in other words, you gave the information to IED about a police officer that was involved in an act of corruption, a rather serious act of corruption, correct. is that correct? IED told you that no such member of the service existed? Right, the allegation was frivolous, that there was no such uh, officer on the precinct, there was no such officer on the force, and within 24 hours, the FIU, after you giving them the information, was, I, was able to determine that a police officer under that identity did, in fact, exist? Yes, ma'am. Did you have any other contacts with IED over the years? Yes, I have. And did you give them information about police corruption? Yes, I have. Could you tell us how IED reacted to you when you gave them information about police corruption? Well, basically, they treated me like I was shit, you know. Even with my, uh, my clear record of being credible, uh, they like to dismiss what I said to them because a lot of it was very harsh, something that would be incredible to believe, but so incredible to believe that it was true. And they just, they didn't care to hear what I had to say. As long as uh, whatever I said didn't involve uh, them doing too much work, I mean, I don't know what to say other than that. Did you get the sense that IED was committed to no, uncovering I, I the full the sense, extent of police corruption? I, I got the sense that they could care less. I got the sense that they, uh, they really didn't care to hear about police corruption. They didn't care to hear who was involved or exactly what was the person was doing. Uh, they wanted to know certain facts, and if the facts didn't pan out the way they liked it, they dismissed the situation, the issue. Okay. I'd like to turn out the information about the 9th Precinct. Did there come a time when you reported the information about corruption in the 9th Precinct to anyone in the New York City Police Department? I'm sorry, rephrase that? Okay. Did you ever report the information about corruption in the 9th Precinct to anyone in the New York City Police Department? Uh, yes. Yes or no? <laughs> Could you tell us about that? Yes, I, I told it to FIU, but originally I, I hadn't told anybody. I wasn't sure who I was dealing with. When I was dealing with IED, they, could, they weren't listening to what I was saying anyway. And to tell them about the knife precinct meant to jeopardize my situation. My, my business, my, uh, I lived in the area, my place of residence. Uh, again, I had an established clientele in the area. All these things would become in jeopardy. So, no, I didn't tell IED about uh, the knife precinct right off the bat. And when did you ultimately tell someone about the ninth precinct? After I found myself very secure with the two uh, officers from FIAU, uh, the officers from FIAU had requested me and asked me if I knew of any other corruption in the department. And at that time, I, uh, I said yes, and they asked me for names, and I gave them uh, names. And the guys at FIAU chuckled and looked around at me, and showed me a list, and I had named uh, at least three people from the list. And from there, we proceeded an investigation. So a list of police officers that the FAU had, of corrupt officers, you were able to identify Correct. in your first they, meeting they, a group of them? They had already been investigating some of the officers that used to hang out in my store. I see. 
What exactly did you tell them at that first meeting about corruption in the 9th Precinct? That I wasn't sure what information I would give them at this point because uh, I had a lot to consider, uh, a lot of self-preservation. I understand that. I could understand that it, from what you said that there certainly could be difficult to give that information. You were friendly with the officers that hung out in your shop, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. You said you, were, you would hang out with them yeah, both they, in your they shop? They used to help me out. They used to give me a line. You know, I had no problem in that precinct. Okay, so my yes. question is this then. Why would you ever give the department information about police corruption connection well, with your shop? As I said, this started in 89, and this was about 91. And it had already gotten uh, way out of hand. It had started with one or two officers just coming in, casually hanging out, doing a little liquor, once in a while doing a little coke. It had escalated to full-fledged parties. I mean, they used to keep my business. My business normally closed at 6 o'clock. My business would normally stay open with these officers inside, or with the gates drawn to 11.30, you know, very late in the evening. <laughs> At a time it became very abusive, I couldn't function, I couldn't get my job done. And because they were friend, uh, very good friends with my co-worker, and because I knew them, and because I had done a lot of favors in the area, etc., you know, I had declined to go after them. But then, after reconsidering uh, the situation, uh, I agreed to help the FIU take down these cops. Did you also know if the information that you provided to the FIU was fruitful, that you would have been paid for the information you provided? Correct. That's standard. If, if you uh, provide information which led to an arrest and conviction, there was uh, money to be gained at the end, yes. Okay. Department records indicate that it was approximately March of 1991 when you first had contact with Ms. Manhattan South FIU. Is that accurate? Uh, I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. Could you tell us what exactly it was that you told Manhattan South FIU when you met with them in March of 1991? Uh, once I, I decided and agreed to help them, I had informed them that it was not only those officers that, that I named, but there were several others, and that they were engaged in a lot of activities, and I described the activities that I knew of. Uh, at the same time, I had informed them of a, of a barbecue in which most of these officers were uh, invited to and were uh, requested to bring uh, BOD, as I said, it's called bring your own drugs. Plus, uh, the person who was throwing the barbecue was going to have a couple of ounces available for uh, casual use. How many police officers did you expect would be at this barbecue where they were told to bring their own drugs? Well, I knew of of at least 12, but I, I, there were a lot more. First of all, I saw the list, and the list had a lot of officers, not only from the 9th Precinct, but it, it had the officers that I knew of from the 9th Precinct. And uh, also, too, there were going to be officers from uh, a Staten Island Precinct, which the officer used to play basketball with, and he, had, by his admission, stated that they used to get into coke and stuff, and they were okay. Who they were cop cops. They were what? Cop cops. What do you mean by cop cops? You know, if, if you, uh, Al Brown, ref oh, excuse me, yeah, Al Brown referred to them as, uh, that they were cops. They were cop cops. Means uh, they were cool. They were able to do uh, narcotics or alcohol and do this stuff, and these guys wouldn't tell. They've already been checked out by each other. So they were cop cops. Way of saying that they were, to use someone else's phrase from yesterday, good cops. Cops that would engage in acts of corruption or use drugs in the job. Yeah, but in this particular instance, the word was cop, cops. I see. Well, cops, cop, excuse me. Now, you say that you saw a list. Who was having this party specifically? Say again? Who was having this party? Uh, Alan Brown. And Alan Brown was a police officer in the 9th Precinct? He was a police officer at that point, yes. Other than cops, did you know of anyone else that was going to be attending this barbecue? Uh, myself was invited with, along with other friends of mine. Uh, my co-worker was invited. A lot of the cops that used to hang in my store were invited, uh, and various people. Anyone else from the community in the 9th Precinct? Yeah, of course. We had uh, the drug dealer that got arrested with Alan Brown. He was coming. Uh, a couple other drug dealers that were from that street. So at this party that this police officer was having, this barbecue, there were going to be at least 12 police officers. And in addition to that, 
other drug dealers yeah. that they hung out with in the precinct? There, there was 12 that I knew of, but there were also more that I didn't know their names. Okay. And yes, there were additional, there were drug dealers that were invited. And how do you know that this police officer was throwing a big party, big bar barbecue, at which cops would be there along with drug dealers from the community? Uh, he did the invitations in front of me a lot of times. So guys would uh, be told, hey, you know, I got this barbecue, whatever, you better come. You know, it's BOD, uh, but I have something available, etc. And bring your girl or whatever, you know. When was this barbecue supposed to take place? Uh, I believe around the 4th of July time, so uh, the weekend of, July, of the 4th of July weekend. 4th of July weekend, 1991. Correct. And this was now March 1991, is that correct? Correct. Did you think that it was unusual to hear about a barbecue or party three and a half months before the event? No, when they, when they like to do something, they like to do it right and big. And Brown liked to do things big. And this was going to be this something was gonna that was going to be big? big? All the main buddies were going to be there. Some former cops that were discharged from the, from the department were going to be there. A uh, lot of known drug dealers were going to be there. A lot of known cops were going to be there. Okay. So you gave the F Manhattan South FIU this information in March of 1991. How did they react to the information about this barbecue that was going to occur? They were enthusiastic. They had, they had considered it to be... Uh, one of the avenues they would take to close a lot of other cases that they had that were, were unsolved or unfounded <laughs> or just in their files. And uh, what this, would, this party, this barbecue would have done, would have tied these uh, officers uh, in, the, in the scene of the crime, as you would say. Mm -hmm. They would be there caught doing their drugs, partying, all high. And at this point, there was supposed to have taken place a raid with myself being wired and another person being wired. Okay. And uh, at times it was also considered that I would go in with an a undercover officer. Uh, in fact, I even asked Brown if I could bring somebody. And he said, yeah, bring whoever you want. And I basically meant that I would bring a female companion. And he said, I don't care, bring whoever you want. You know, he trusted me that I would bring somebody that's cool. So you and the, Manha well, the Manhattan South FIU then had developed a tactical plan for infiltrating this 4th of July barbecue. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Had you ever been asked to wear a wire to that barbecue? Yes, I was. Did you agree to wear a wire to that barbecue? Yes, I did. Did you ever make plans to have another police officer, a female police officer, accompany you to that barbecue? Uh, that was evaluated, yes. That was uh, reviewed, and that was supposed to be the plan, yes. And in fact, did you ask Police Officer Brown if you could bring a guest to the barbecue? Yeah, I okayed it with him. He said, yeah, bring anybody I want. Again, I say he trusted so my judgment of the fact that I would bring somebody who was cool. So plans were well underway, and we'll hear more about those plans the next witness. Was a district attorney involved with the investigation at this point? Yes, he was. And was a district attorney involved in developing the tactical plans for infiltrating this party? Yes. The okay. district attorney became aware to me at the beginning of the case, way back in March, when uh, we had proposed that the, the tactics we would use to catch these officers. And you were at meetings with the assistant district attorney? Yes, I was. And what was the assistant district attorney's reaction to the potential that this case had? He loved it. It was going to be a great case. We were going to get a lot of arrests. It meant, uh, for me, it meant a very good financial reward. I mean, you know, I won't deny that. Also, at the same time, it meant that uh, it was going to close down shop for a lot of guys in the ninth precinct. Close down shop for a lot of guys in the ninth precinct. And by that, you mean that the corrupt activities of a group yeah. of cops would have to end? Correct. Did there come a time when you decided in anticipation of that Fourth of July barbecue to buy drugs off of police officer Alan Brown? Yes, it was considered that we get a, a solid case. Since my closest tie to those officers was Alan Brown, it was considered that we get some concrete evidence on Alan Brown and lieu of getting the rest of the officers later. Okay, so did you, in Probably. fact, make a purchase then of drugs off of, off of Alan Brown? Yes, I did. And would that have been on May the 13th, 1991? I believe so, yes. Okay. And you were the person, did you wear a body recorder at that time in connection with this purchase? Yes, I did. And were you able to capture conversations of Police Officer Brown in connection with your selling him drugs? Yes, I did. Okay. He made full admission and at the same time, he sold us drugs. So after May 13, 1991, there was evidence that the department had that a police officer was using drugs. Is that correct? 
Yes, we had a controlled buy that was successful, yes, ma'am. After that first controlled buy, did anyone in the department ever ask you or the, uh, the team of investigators to expedite the operation because now there was knowledge that a member of the department was using drugs and was on the street? No, not to expedite it, but to uh, span on the, on the case, to, to widen it, to go as deep as we can with as many officers as we can. And who was it that wanted you to go as deep as you could? Who were you working with at this time? At this time, I was working with the two uh, officers from the field internal affairs unit and uh, assistant district attorney. Okay, so Manhattan South FIU, I'd just like to know. And after the first spy, were you continuing with your efforts to develop the tactical plan for infiltrating this, this party? Yes. Did there come a time when there was a second purchase of drugs off of police officer Alan Brown? Yes, ma'am. Were you the undercover that was used to make this purchase? Yes, I was. Did you once again you wear a body recorder? Yes, I did. Did you capture conversations about this police officer using drugs? I caught the conversation of him using drugs, and at this conversation he also confirmed the barbecue was going to take place, and possibly the people that were going to be there. So he mentioned that there would be other officers at the barbecue on the tape? Yes. And he confirmed that the barbecue was going ahead as planned? He, he made invitations of other officers while I was wearing his body wire. He did, and that was recorded? Yes, ma'am. And that recording was given to Manhattan South FIAU? Yes, it was. And to the district attorney? Yes, it was. And the date of that second buy was June the 4th, 1991? Yes, it was. So 30, okay, so 22 days had already passed between the first buy off of Alan Brown and the second buy. Is that accurate? Yes, it was. <clears throat> After the second buy, when you now had evidence twice of a police officer using drugs, did any one from within the department urged you to expedite the investigation at this point, right after the second buy? Uh, right after the second right buy? Right after like the second immediately buy. after? Immediately after. No. And after the second buy, did you continue plans to develop your tactical plan for infiltrating? Yes, it was, discussed, it was discussed that we were going to try to buy our narcotics, possibly even from the person that was also providing them to Al Brown and also to possibly buy uh, firearms. Okay, let me back up for a moment then. You mean, when you made the second buy, there was also discussion on that tape about police officer Brown being able to purchase guns illegally? Illegally, yes. And was any decision made on how to develop that information? Uh, well, it was tactical at that point. There was no certain did the decision. district attorney in Manhattan South FIU instruct you at the thir for when the third buy occurred to say anything to police officer Alan Brown to try to develop the information on guns? Yes, they wanted to be to uh, infiltrate further and deeper, if I can, yes. And so were you instructed then by the DA and Manhattan South FIU to try to purchase guns off of Alan Brown at the third buy? Yes, ma'am. And what was the purpose of these purchases of drugs off of Alan Brown? Was that the objective of the investigation? No, it wasn't. It was uh, to build the foundation uh, for the entire investigation, which really was uh, all the cops that were alleged to be bad in that precinct. Okay. Now let's get to the third buy. The date was set for the third buy of June the 14th, 1991. Is that correct? Yes. And that was 22 days before the barbecue that had been the focus of your investigation. Is that accurate? Correct. And at this point, you said that you would develop a tactical plan for infiltrating that party. Is that correct? Correct. You would agree to wear wire? Yes, I did. You were going to possibly be accompanied by another police officer. Is that accurate? Yes, ma'am. And other plans were well underway that we'll hear about from the next witness. What was your understanding of what was going to happen at that third buy initially? Initially, it was just going to be a controlled buy. We were going to buy whatever possible, whether it be firearms or narcotics. And uh, we were going to elaborate more on uh, people that were going to be at the party and try to get that on tape. And instead, what happened on June the 14th, 1991, 22 days away from the 4th of July barbecue? Uh, um, on that particular morning, uh, myself and the person I was working with on the cover were informed that uh, that control by would actually be uh, a control by and an arrest. What was your reaction to that decision, to that I order? I was pissed. I was angry because we had developed the case and we had 
enough to make a very big case, and they were just willing to settle for one guy. And what was the reaction of the Manhattan South FIU investigators that you were working with? They were pissed off. They, they, they couldn't really show it uh, as far as being angry, but they were very displeased that our case was being uh, interrupted that way, or but disrupted. They, did they make their anger clear, though? Yes, they did. And what was the reaction of the assistant district attorney that was working on this case? Also furious, furious. Did you know who made that decision to arrest Officer Brown on that June 14th day, June 14th day? Um, it was my understanding that it had come from higher ups. Okay, we'll pursue that well, in when just you say a minute. We, okay, go. When you say it was your understanding, what is your understanding based upon, factually? Well, here it is. I'm in a situation where I'm pissed off, and I'm saying, you know, uh, one cop versus uh, five or six, seven cops. Uh, to me, that's more money. They're cutting my... They're cutting my I understand, but what... You made a statement in answer to my first question that you understand was higher ups that ordered the arrest without waiting for the development of a case against a number of police officers. Is that correct? Correct. What do you base that understanding on? Were you told anything? By I, was, I was told this, yes. I was told this by the officers that I was working with, that they were only at liberty to give me the response that it came from higher ups. Before there were other details to that. We'll get to that in just a minute. Before we get to that, which will be the final point today, I'd like to ask if you could explain to the public what the impact of the order that came down from within the department to arrest Alan Brown 22 days before the barbecue had on that investigation. It, it killed, killed the rest of the case. And why was that? Because allowing this party to exist would have been catching all these officers uh, in the act, and if the party was cut down, then these officers would be alerted. And since uh, Brown was like one of the major parts of the crew, it would mean that either Brown would either rat them out or they were compromised. So nobody would go anyway, even if he did have it. And of course, was the Fourth of July barbecue going to take place? Uh, to my knowledge, it did not. Whose barbecue was that going to be? Al Brown's barbecue. Was it likely that after he was arrested, he'd still have this barbecue? No, uh, I don't think so. Mr. X, was there a single legitimate reason that you were aware of for ordering the arrest of Alan Brown 22 days before this barbecue? Well, I was, I mean, I could give you the, the official reason or I could give you the real reason. Before we get to that, just if you could answer this question that I just asked, are you aware of a single legitimate reason for ordering the arrest of Alan Brown 22 days before the barbecue? Yes. Have a legitimate reason? A legitimate reason? Their reason. The response reason. I don't know if it's legitimate or not. To me, it wasn't legitimate, no. Okay, that's what I was getting at. Could you tell us what your understanding of why the order to arrest Brown came down 22 days before the barbecue, despite the you, consequence of that Do you want the order? official reason or, or the real reason? Why don't we hear both? Let's start with the official reason. The official reason was is that the department couldn't allow an officer who they know were ingesting cocaine to be in possession of a firearm and be performing duties in the city of New York as a police officer. That was the official reason. And what and did you understand the real reason to The be? real reason was is that if, if this barbecue took place and the officers uh, would be exposed, then it would show that there was a heavy criminal activity within the police department of the 9th Precinct and that it would make some people in the ranks look very bad. Uh, and that it was part of an embarrassment scheme. That's my understanding. They, they were feared that it was going to draw a big embarrassment. It was going to show that many cops were crooked, etc. And that was your understanding of why the order came down? Yes, ma'am. At this point, we have no further questions. We'll hear in a few moments, if there's any other questions or commissions, but then we'll hear from the detective who ran this investigation. Thank you, Mr. Eck. Thank you.
did. Could you tell us why that is? I'm still currently conducting a confidential investigation regarding uh, internal investigations. Thank you for that. New York City Police Department also asked that no photographs be taken, no visual identification be made of this witness because of the sensitive nature of investigations that he's involved in. You may proceed, Ms. Cook. Can you tell us what grade detective you are in the New York City Police Department? I'm a first grade detective. Can you tell us what it means to be a first grade detective? It's the highest ranking uh, detectives that uh, you could achieve in the department. Where have you been assigned in the department for the last 22 years? The Manhattan South Field Internal Affairs Unit. Detective, are you the investigator who ran the case that Mr. X just described a few moments ago? Yes. And have you worked with Mr. X in the 9th Precinct case? Yes, I did. And was it his information and assistant as an undercover which led to the arrest of one police officer? Yes. How many cooperating witnesses have you worked on in your, 20, worth in your 22 years in Manhattan South FIU? Several. M very, m many people, uh, many cooperating. And how would you rank Mr. X relative to the other cooperating witnesses that you've worked with? Um, excellent. As an excellent witness, as an excellent informer. Was he one of your best? Yes, he was. Mr. X testified that at a critical juncture in the investigation, an order came down from within the department to arrest Officer Brown. Did you hear that testimony? Or yes. is that consistent with your recollection? Yes, that's consistent. Detective, could you tell us? Uh, me, would you please keep your voice up when you respond? Yes, sir. Thank you. What was your reaction to the order that came down from within the department to arrest Police Officer Brown 22 days before the 4th of July barbecue? Uh, I was surprised that it came down. Uh, we were dismayed about it. When you say we, who do you mean? Well, me, the other investigators that uh, were, uh, were part of the investigation at the time, and uh, the ADA's office. The ADA being the district district attorney? That's correct. Why were you, the other investigators working on the investigation, and the assistant district attorney dismayed, to use your language, by the decision to arrest Alan Brown at that point? We felt that the investigation could have continued further, and if it did continue further, we would have involved other police officers that uh, we had knowledge about that uh, were doing or conducting, uh, that were involved in narcotics. How many police officers did you think that you had the potential of uncovering evidence of corruption and ultimately arresting as a result of this investigation? Anywhere from uh, half a dozen to a dozen police officers, if not more. But you ultimately arrested a police officer. Why doesn't that mean that your investigation was a success? Well, we had information about other police officers uh, that were involved in drugs and that were involved with the same police officer. Uh, at the time, we had also information that uh, there was going to be a barbecue on the 4th of July weekend in July of 91 that would have involved those police officers and, and police officer Brown. And we, to our understanding, we had information that uh, narcotics, cocaine, was uh, being ordered for that party to be used by those police officers. Are you aware of a single legitimate reason for the order that came down within the department to arrest Officer Brown 22 days before the barbecue? No, I'm not. Are you familiar generally with the 77th Precinct case? Yes. Is that a case which led to the arrest of 13 police officers in 1986? Yes. In your opinion, was there a reasonable likelihood that the 9th Precinct corruption case could have been as large as the 77th Precinct case? Very possible, yes. And was that clear to IAD? I believe so. From my recollection, they did know, they were, they were appraised of uh, what was going on with the investigation. I'd like to advise the commissioners and the public at this point that as will be made clear in the final report, Detective Ferrugia's testimony has been corroborated by the other investigators who worked in the 9th Precinct case and by the Assistant District Attorney 
working on that case. Commission attorneys and investigators have interviewed the other FIU investigators and supervisors on the case, including the former commanding officers of Manhattan South FIAU. They have uniformly indicated that they did not agree with the order to prematurely close the case, felt that there was no legitimate reason for closing it of which they were aware, and all testified that the order to prematurely arrest Alan Brown eliminated the opportunity to make a precinct-wide corruption case. Is that consistent with your That's understanding? Certainly yes, yes. Detective Ferugia, when were you appointed to the department? Uh, January 2nd, 1970. Where have you been assigned within the department? I've been assigned to the warrant squad. I've been assigned to the 17th precinct, uh, Manhattan South Task Force, and temporarily, temporarily assigned to... Uh, sure. I, I was assigned to the 17th precinct, uh, to the Manhattan South Task Force, uh, temporarily signed to the 9th Precinct at one time, and temporarily signed to, to the U.S. Attorney's Office. I'd like to turn to the 9th Precinct for a moment. How serious a problem was police corruption in the 9th Precinct based on your personal knowledge? Well, I myself had conducted several um, investigations into 9th Precinct personnel. The um, the extent of, uh, of which led me to believe that the uh, corruption or misconduct, serious misconduct in the 9th Precinct was widespread. And what type of police corruption was most prevalent? I believe uh, corruption or misconduct dealing with narcotics. Do you know whether IAD and top commanding officers in the department knew about the allegations of corruption against police officers in the 9th Precinct? Yes, I believe they did know. During your years, your 22 years in Manhattan South FIU, how many opportunities like the 9th Precinct case did you have? Let me rephrase that. How many precinct-wide cases for pr serious corruption were ever made in a Manhattan South Precinct? I believe one, maybe two. One, maybe two in your 22 years on the job? Yes. And given that, how would you and the other investigators rank this ninth precinct investigation in importance in Manhattan South FIAU? As one of the most important. Did there come a time when Mr. X, I'd like to turn to the investigation now, did there come a time when Mr. X gave you information about police corruption in the ninth precinct? Yes. What did he tell you, when you at your first meeting? The first, first time we met Mr. Rex was in the early part of 1991. We were discussing an entirely different case at the time, which had come down from the Internal Affairs Division. And at, the, at that meeting, we had asked him questions regarding certain police officers in the 9th Precinct, at which time uh, we had received positive answers regarding narcotics use and involvement. And what else did he tell you at that first meeting? He, he informed us about uh, certain police officers that had used drugs in his presence. Okay. And he mentioned the barbecue as well? The barbecue was mentioned uh, shortly after that first meeting. Okay. So shortly after your meeting with Mr. X. Did you open an investigation in the 9th Precinct based on the information he provided you? Yes, we did. And what was the objective of that investigation? The objective of that investigation was to to substantiate the allegations about the use or distribution of narcotics by Police Officer Brown and other members of the service in the 9th Precinct. And was there a particular event that you were targeting? Yes, the, the 4th of July weekend for 1991 uh, was the event that we were targeting uh, that the barbecue was set for and some of these officers, if not more, were uh, invited to. Okay. I'd like to turn to those officers for a moment. Let's first start with Brown. Had Police Officer Brown ever been investigated by the department before? Yes. Yes, he has. Department records indicate that there were over seven corruption allegations filed against him at the, in March of 1991. Is that consistent with your understanding? Yes, that's right. What was the nature of most of those corruption allegations? They were narcotic-based allegations. 
And do you know if some of them dated back to the early 1980s? Yes, I did. Were there any allegations linking Officer Brown to other police officers in the 9th Precinct? Yes, there was. Could you tell us about that briefly? Um, try and recall the particular case. Were they, did they generally involve association and narcotics-related activities? Yes, they did. With, with yes, other did. officers in the 9th Precinct? With officers in the 9th Precinct, yes. The group of officers that were going to be at the party? Yes. Actually, we'll get to that in a moment, because what I'd like to do now is to refer you to this chart. This chart has been prepared to help the public and the commissioners understand the scope of your investigation. For the sake of confidentiality, the names of the police officers have not been disclosed, with the exception of the name Alan Brown, because that's a matter of public record. Detective, are you familiar with this chart? Yes, I am. When you were requested to appear at private hearings before the Mollen Commission, did you review this chart? Yes, I did. And did you, at that time, review the names of the police officers on that chart? Yes. Do the red circles indicate the police officers that you expected would be at that party? Yes, that's correct. And including Officer Brown, does that mean that there were 10 police officers you were yes, expecting? Yes, that's correct. Do the yellow circles indicate the network of police officers that you thought there was a reasonable likelihood of arresting through the evidence gathered at the barbecue? Yes, that's correct. And altogether, does that come to a total of approximately 17 officers, including Alan Brown? That's right. And two of them were former members of the department, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So at least 15 current members of the department? That's correct. Some of, as you can see, all but one of those police officers is colored in yellow in the middle. Does that indicate, to your knowledge, that they had former corruption allegations against them? Yes. Could you tell us what the nature of most of those corruption allegations was? Narcotics. Drugs. Did some of those officers have as many as seven or eight allegations of corruption against them? Some of them do, yes. You mentioned before that the 9th Precinct investigation had the potential to be another 77th Precinct case. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Could you explain to the commissioners and the public why you think that the case had such potential? Well, considering the background of the police officers that were involved, that were attending the party, we felt that if we had caught these police officers at the party in drug use or with drugs, we may have been uh, able to uh, sustain a better investigation and continue uh, in a sort of a domino effect and continue with the investigation and, and eventually uh, arrest or uh, dismiss from the department several other police officers. Were many of the officers on this chart former partners of Alan Brown? Yes, several of them were. Were any of the members of this Police officers on this chart, were their names found in the books of drug dealers? Yes, there were a few. And those names were found together in the names, together the names were found in a single In a single book, book, yes. Were most of the names on this chart in Alan Brown's address book at the time of arrest? Yes. Did many of these officers on this chart share a common apartment at one time? Yes, in one way or another. And did many of the officers at this chart have allegations of narcotics-related corruption filed against them together? That's correct. That's correct. So the network you're saying was quite strong, and the connection between this group of police officers. That's right. I'd like to briefly turn to IAD's involvement with this case. Do you recall attending a meeting in March of 1991 at IAD? Yes, I do. Without revealing any names, could you Tell us generally who was there from the Internal Affairs Division. There were some, I believe, uh, lieutenants, captains, and inspectors at the, at the meeting, maybe a chief, too. I, I don't remember exactly, but they were high ranking. Were they top commanding officers in IAD that attended that meeting? Yes. Was it common practice for you to attend such a high level meeting at the Internal Affairs Division with a group of high ranking officers? No. In fact, in your 20 years, 22 years in Manhattan South FIU, how many times had you been summoned to IAD to attend a meeting with such a group of high-ranking officers? 
to my recollection, I think there was one other time. One other case in 22 years? Yes. Was that also a large case with the potential to uncover precinct-wide corruption? Yes, it was. Did the Manhattan South FIU at that meeting in March explain to IAD the potential that this case had? Yes, we, we informed them of the uh, barbecue, we informed them of the drugs, and we informed them of, of the number of uh, police officers that may be involved. Did IAD ask to be briefed regularly on the progress and development of that case? Yes, they, uh, they did ask. And was that carried out? It was, yes. Records indicate that at the time of the meeting, the Internal Affairs Division was closing a 10-month investigation against four police officers who were the target of your investigation. Do you recall that? I, I did read the report that, uh, that you offered me, yes. I want to get to that in a moment. Did IED, at the time of that meeting, ever provide you with the files on that investigation? Did IED provide me with the information regarding that case? In March of 1991. At that meeting? Yes. No. Did IED even mention to you that they had closed an investigation that week involving four targets of and your investigation? No, they never informed me about that. When did you learn about the IAD case involving those four police officers in the 9th Precinct? In spring of 93, spring of this year. So almost two years after that meeting? Excuse me? No, two months after that meeting. After the March 1991 uh, yes, meeting? Yes, that's right. Ended. I'm sorry. You said 1993. You meant yeah. 1991? No, I meant uh, spring of 93 is when I was informed about that particular case. So it would have been two years then after that first meeting with IED? That's correct. How did you find out about the existence of that case? Uh, through your efforts. So in other words, when you were subpoenaed to come to the Mala Commission and we asked you questions about investigations and we asked you about that case, that's how you first learn about its existence? Yes. Well, at that time, uh, I'm not sure of the uh, time span here, but we had uh, requested certain C number cases uh, which were, were not available to us before this year. And then we, we did find out that uh, IED had conducted that investigation a year, year and a half before we got that information. Would it have been helpful to you to have that access to those files while you were conducting your ninth precinct case? Yes, it would have. And despite that, you were not even informed that that investigation had ever been conducted? That's correct. We were never informed about it. I'd like to turn back now to the ninth precinct network case that you were investigating. After the meeting in March of 1991, did you continue to develop the investigation? After what date? After the meeting with the Internal Affairs Division of March of 1991, did you continue to develop plans in connection with your investigation? Yes, we did. Was the Assistant District Attorney in Manhattan working with you? Yes, he was. And what was the focus of the investigation? As I said before, the focus of the investigation was to uh, substantiate the allegation of drug use and, and uh, and dealings in drugs by police officer Brown and other members of the service in the 9th Precinct. As many as 12 or more members of the department? Yes. Did you have a tactical plan that you were developing for infiltrating this barbecue in the summer of 1991? Yes, we, we had reason to believe that uh, narcotics, as I said before, was going to be present at, at the party. and. We had made plans to uh, get into the party with an undercover and Mr. X. And did you ask Mr. X if he would wear a wire? Yes, we did. Did he agree to wear a wire? He did. Were there any plans to have a police officer accompany Mr. X yes, to the barbecue? Yes, there was. That's correct. And those plans were underway? Excuse me? Those plans were underway as well? Yes, they were. Were you doing any surveillances of the house where the barbecue was going to be? Yes, we did. We took photographs of the area, and we studied the area to see where we could set up uh, certain uh, surveillance fans. Where was this barbecue going to take place generally, if you could just tell us what borough? In Staten Island. And was it Police Officer Brown's home or a family member's home? Excuse me? Was it a family member's home that the barbecue was going to take y place? Yes, it was. Did there come a point where you were working with the district attorney to issue warrants in connection with this investigation? 
Yes. So that the tactical plan had actually gotten that far? Yes, it certainly did. Did there come a time when you made a purchase of drugs off of Alan Brown? Yes, uh, we did that three times. Okay, and was the first purchase of drugs on May the 13th, 1991? Uh, pro yes, I think it was, yes. And after the first purchase of drugs, was IAD briefed on that? They were. Was the commanding officer of the patrol borough Manhattan South briefed on that? Yes, he was. At that point, was anyone rushing you to make a second buy off of police officer Brown, now that you knew that he was a police officer using drugs? No, nobody was rushing us. Did anyone even suggest to you that you monitor police officer Brown more closely, now that you know that there's a police officer using drugs in the department? No. Was there any sense of crisis at all over the fact that he had now purchased drugs? Not that I know of. And after the first spot, did you continue plans for the barbecue? Yes, we did, and we made the plans, and we started making plans for a second buy. Okay, and did that second, when did that second buy occur, beginning of June? Uh, yes, it, I don't remember the exact date, but that was in the beginning of June. I think it was maybe June 4th. That's right, that's what department records indicate, that it was on June the 4th, which would be 22 days after the first spy, is that correct? That's correct. After the first spy, was the, was the, was the second buy successful? Yes, it was. Was there any conversations that were captured of any significance? Um, yes, I be we had received additional information that uh, through Mr. X, that, uh, and I believe it was on tape, that uh, guns were available through Police Officer Brown. And did you decide to try to develop that information in connection with this investigation? Yes, we did. What was your plan? Well, everything was tentative at this time, but we had discussed it with the district attorney's office, and we had plans possibly to purchase guns from Police Officer Brown through Mr. X. And for the guns, what was the reason that you wanted to develop the gun evidence if you'd already had evidence of purchase of narcotics? Well, we wanted to fortify our case against Police Officer Brown, and with, with the hope that Police Officer Brown would uh, turn state's evidence on us. But was, was the objective to try to develop evidence in anticipation of the barbecue? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And the, were the purchase of guns, in fact, going to be made at the time of the barbecue? I don't remember exactly when the purchase of the guns would have been made. I, I don't know, I, I can't remember offhand. When, when that was going to be made, but it would have been approximately about that time, yes. Okay. After the second buy of drugs off of Police Officer Brown, was anybody rushing you at this point with, to, for the, with the investigation? After the second buy? Just after the second buy. No. Was anyone particularly alarmed over the fact that now you had even more evidence that a member of the department was using drugs? Not that I'm aware of. Was anybody expressing concerns that there was a threat to the community at this point? Again, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Was a date eventually set for a third purchase of drugs off of Alan Brown? Yes, it was. And was that date June the 14th, 1991? I believe so. And was that 22 days before the barbecue was scheduled to occur? Yes, it was 22 days before the barbecue. So at this point, you've made two buys off of Alan Brown, is that correct? That's correct. You've gotten confirmation of the party not only through Mr. X, but also on tape, is that correct? That's correct. All plans were underway for infiltrating the barbecue? Yes. In fact, you'd even gone to the extent of working on the warrants with the district attorney? That's correct. Now you're 22 days away from the barbecue. What happened? We were, we were told that we were going to make the third buy from police officer Brown and arrest him at that time. What was your reaction to that? Well, we took a step backwards and tried to think about it. We were all disappointed at that whole situation that we had to arrest Brown. Uh, we felt that there was more to the investigation, and if we continued, it would have yielded a lot more than police officer Brown. And what was the reaction of the district attorney? He was totally surprised. He was dismayed, disappointed about it. And what impact did that have on the outcome of this investigation and the opportunity to uncover corruption it, of a whole network of police officers in the 9th Precinct. It basically brought the investigation to a stop. 
I want to just clarify what it was that you were asking for. Excuse me, did you express, did Manhattan South FIU express their concern and their dismay to anyone outside of Manhattan South FIU? Well, besides the district attorney's office, we, uh, we expressed it to our commanding officer at the time. And I'm sure that was uh, relayed over to IED. Okay, I'd just like to indicate that department records indicate that it was. But what exactly was it that you were asking for? Was Manhattan South FIU suggesting that Alan Brown not be arrested? No, they were saying to arrest police officer Brown. But you were asking for a delay of 22 days, is that correct? We were asking the delay to, uh, so we could go ahead with the investigation and continue into the barbecue. Did the Internal Affairs Division understand what the impact of arresting Alan Brown 22 days before the barbecue would be? I believe they did. And was the Internal Affairs Division aware that all you were asking for was 22 days? Uh, yes. Was the Internal Affairs Division aware that 22 days had passed between just the first buy and the second buy? That's correct. And despite that, the order remained? Yes, it did remain. I'd like to turn to that order for a moment now. Who communicated the order to affect the arrest of Alan Brown? I don't know who communicated the order. We got the order from our uh, CO, which was Captain Miley at the time. From the commanding officer of Manhattan South? Manhattan South, yes. Do you have any understanding of who communicated the order to him? I believe he received it or he had talked to uh, the borough head at the time. The commanding officer Commander of the patrol of borough? patrol borough Manhattan South. What was your understanding of who ordered the arrest of Alan Brown? My understanding from from what I could remember is that I believe it was a combination of the borough commander and internal affairs. May I ask what you base that understanding on? Excuse me, sir? May, may I ask what information you base that understanding on? As to who, as to who directed that Officer Brown be arrested at the next buy instead of awaiting the outcome of your further efforts to investigate other police officers as well. Just general conversation within the unit. I'd like to point out to the commissioners to follow up on, on the chair's question, which is an important one, that the one area where memories of the top commanding officers in IAD and Manhattan South Patrol Bureau seemed to fade in the course of private hearings over the past few months was with who specifically directed the order within IAD. At private hearings, commission investigators and attorneys questioned the top commanding officers in IAD and the commanding officer of Manhattan South Patrol Borough about who directed the order. When questioned, not a single commanding officer of IAD could remember who directed the order, although all agreed that the top commanding officers of IAD had been regularly apprised of the progress of that investigation and all agreed that the order would have had to have been authorized by the top commanding officers of IAD or the chief of the Inspectional Services Bureau. Indeed, the evidence unequivocally establishes that the order from within the department was directed by the commanding officers within the Inspectional Services Bureau, either alone or jointly with the commanding officer of Manhattan South Patrol Bureau, and was authorized by the commanding officers of IAD and IAB despite the fact that the order knowingly eliminated an opportunity for Manhattan South to uncover and prove wide-scale narcotics-related corruption in the 9th Precinct. Detective, at this point I'd like to ask you, again, if you were aware at this point of a single legitimate reason for the order to arrest Alan Brown 22 days before the barbecue. Excuse me, say that again? Are you aware of a single legitimate reason for the order to arrest Alan Brown? No. Some officers and members of the department have suggested that the decision to arrest Alan Brown after the third buy and to prematurely close the case might have been based on a concern that he had been that he be taken off the street because he was a danger to the community. Do you agree that that would have been a legitimate reason? Well, that's one of the reasons that we were told, but I I don't believe it was a legitimate reason at all. Well, detective, traditionally. Has that not been the reason given in other instances, if you know, where there are investigations as to possible corruption on the number of police officers, 
and a key officer will be arrested, and the reason given is to get him off the street and to take away his gun? Uh, I, I haven't had the opportunity to come across that. Have you ever heard about that policy? Yes. Yes, I have heard. In your opinion, as apparently a longtime member of FIAU, do you think that that is a valid reason to do so? Not in this case, no. And in fact, in your wouldn't investigation... You, wouldn't you suggest that it might be more important to get a larger number of police officers who carry guns off the street if they're corrupt cops? Well, if, if the concern was that we had a police officer that was using drugs out on the street and that had a gun, on the other hand, you had several other police officers that were doing the same thing. And I, I think it was more important to get more of the police officers instead of just a single one. Thank you. Exactly. And how many police officers did you think that you could pretend you could get off the street as a result of carrying out your investigation? I would say any, anywhere from uh, 6 to 15, any, anywhere that you could look on that chart and, and, and see the number of police officers involved. Okay. I want to just point out one other factor to the commissioners that goes to the, just, the question that the chairman just asked. Are you familiar with the Central Personnel Index of Police Officer Brown? Uh, yes, I am. And does that show that there have been allegations of narcotics use against Officer Brown since 1980? Yes, I'm familiar with that. And does it show that in 1988, three years before this incident, that there was a recommendation that Police Officer Brown be terminated from the department? Yes, I recall that. And are you aware that despite that, he was placed on disciplinary probation for one year? Yes, I'm familiar with that. And during the period that he was on probation, he was found to be wrongfully in possession of forged documents. His evaluation was below standards, and there was an allegation, several, at least one allegation, that he was associating with known felons, and he was intoxicated regularly while on the job. This was during the period that he was on probation. Detective. Would that have been a basis for terminating Officer Brown from the department several years ago? I, I, would, I would say so at this time, yes. At this point, I would like to present to the commissioners and the public the testimony of three officers that were involved with the investigation. Are you here with this witness? Please? No, we're not, actually. They're tape recordings, Your Honor, that we're going to play at this time. play three tapes. It should just take a few moments and then we're going to complete with this witness. I'd like to state the following. When questioned about the impact that the 9th Precinct Network investigation would have had on the department if the investigation had not been prematurely closed as it was, a top-ranking commanding officer in IAD said the following wait, wait, when questioned under oath just a moment, at a private hearing. Just, just a moment, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, can we get some order here, please? All right, uh, please, will you be seated?
Mr. Kelly, uh, will you please uh, conclude that now? Okay. Um, I, Ms. Corfa, would you uh, repeat yes. your last question, yes. please? When questioned about the impact that the Ninth Precinct Network investigation would have had on the department if the investigation had not been prematurely closed, a top-ranking officer in IAD responded as follows when questioned under oath at a private hearing. I would like to ask at this point that tape number one be played. When asked how the commanding officers of the department react to precinct-wide corruption cases and how they wanted large-scale corruption cases to be handled, the former commanding officer of Manhattan South FIU testified that after the 77th precinct scandal in 1986, that the message that was communicated was not to make big cases but to fragment them. I'd like you to hear that testimony and I'd like to ask that tape two be played at this time. And finally, when the supervisor of the investigation of this network case was asked why, in his opinion, the case was prematurely closed at the expense of losing a case of corruption against 15 police officers, the supervisor of this ninth precinct investigation responded as follows. I'd like to ask that tape number three be played. Detective, one final question. Based on your opinion, do you think that the decision to prematurely close the ninth precinct corruption case was influenced by a desire or is based on a desire to avoid another 77th precinct scandal and to avoid embarrassment to the department and the commanding officers responsible for the precinct? Yes, thank you. I have no further questions at this time.
Neighborhood Detective are a number of the officers who are the subject of your investigation and against whom there have been allegations of corruption still in the department? Uh, some of them are still in the department, yes. The uh, majority of them are still in the department. Thank you very much, Detective. You. you performed a great public service by your willingness to come here and testify. And on behalf of the people of our city, I thank you. You're welcome, sir. Right, at this time, we will recess and we will uh, resume at 9 30. The Commission investigators have conducted a series of action desk integrity tests over the past nine months to test how, as Sergeant Weber and Chief Sullivan called it, the nerve center of the anti corruption apparatus was functioning. At this point, I would like to call the commission investigator who was responsible for supervising that as the witness to join Sergeant Weber. She's already been sworn in. Thank you. What is your position with the Mullen Commission? I am the senior investigator, and I was assigned to supervise the Action Desk um, project. Where were you assigned, where were you employed prior to the Marlin Commission? The New York City Department of Investigation. And what was your position there? Senior investigator. And for how long were you with the Department of Investigation? Three years. Could you tell the commissioners how the action desk analysis and audit was conducted? Three investigators from the commission and myself conducted 21 integrity tests for the past nine months, from January the 8th to October 2nd, 1993. We had a basic script. What we would do was to call the action desk at various times of the day and various days of the week in order to get a representative sampling. We would tell the officer that we had information about corruption, serious corruption, and that we knew the identity of the police officer. This was done in order to test the Internal Affairs Division uh, officer to give us correction. This was, te this was to test the Can IAB officer. Please try and keep your voice up. Okay. This was to test the IAB officer to see if they would ask for the name of the police officer in question. We, was, we would also tell them that we did not know what to do with the information. Once again, we wanted to test to see if they would encourage us to give them the information. We also requested from the New York City Police Department action desk reels. You mean the actual reels from the action desk? Yes. Okay. We wanted to listen to actual action desk conversation. Uh, I listened to four reels of approximately 10 hours. Did commission investigators and attorneys also conduct an on-site inspection of the action desk several months ago? Yes, they did. Could you tell the commissioners, please, what the results of the commission integrity tests were? The results were that the police department action desk did not wish to obtain any police corruption information. In most of the cases, the IAB investigators will make little to no effort to solicit basic critical information from us. And you mentioned in your script, you said that you told them you had the police officer's identity. That's How correct. often did they try to get the police officer's identity from you in your calls? Correction, um, would you repeat the question, please? Yes. When you made the call to the action desk, did you say that you had the name of the police officer? Yes. And how often did the action desk officer encourage you to provide the name of that officer or even ask you for the name of the officer? Less than 50%. You also mentioned that you told the action desk officer that you were reluctant to give your name. In how many instances did the action desk supervisor try to convince you to provide your identity? Not a single time did the IAB officer asked for our name. 
You also indicated that as part of the script, you said that you couldn't decide what to do and that you asked the action desk officer whether or not you should give this information about police corruption. How did the officer react to that? In most cases, the reaction was, it's up to you. It's your choice. We can't tell you what to do. Sergeant Weber, you said that you've been a supervisor of the action desk now for over 10 years. What should an action desk uh, officer do when a complainant on the line says, I don't know whether I should give you the information I have or not? Well, the <coughs> officer at the action desk should induce or try to uh, solicit information by making that uh, individual part of a team effort to, uh, to accomplish the objectives of preparing a proper log. So should they should try to solicit that information? Correct. They, that information should be solicited and induced, and, and the individual should be try to work in a cooperative spirit with the division. But despite that, are you saying that in 50 percent of the cases, no one from the action desk even attempted to persuade you to give them the information you had about police corruption? That's correct. Could you tell us how many cases we're talking about, how many times this happened? How many times you did uh, indeed place such a call? We conducted 21 integrity tests. 21? Yes. And when Ms. Kornfeld, uh, Ms. Kornfeld mentioned script, you used the same language each time? That's correct. And that's the script to which you are referring and she was referring? Yes, it is. Did you ever feel that you were being discouraged from giving information when you called the action desk? Yes, I was. Do you have any examples of tapes which would show when you felt discouraged? Yes, I do. I would now like to ask the commission investigator play tape number one. And for the commissioners, you should have a script that in the upper right-hand corner says tape number one that we provided just for your convenience. on hold? Yes, I was. For how long did the action desk officer place you on hold at this point? Uh, the first time he placed me on hold for six minutes and 55 seconds. So at this point you were then placed on hold for six minutes and 55 seconds? That's correct. Three minutes and 46 seconds waiting time redacted. Resume. Three minutes and nine seconds redacted. Resume. Hello? Yes? Yeah. We 
make up your mind yet? No, no. Uh, I've been hearing like a beep. What is that? That's a tape recorder. Oh, but does that mean I could be identified? Well, not really. I mean, there's voice identification. I mean, uh, a lot of ways, if you want to be identified, they could uh, have that uh, call, uh, what do you call that thing? You press the button, you can find out uh, what number you're calling from. There's that, and there's voice identification. Oh, hold on a minute. I got another phone call, all right? At that point, what happened in the conversation? He placed me on the hold again for... Three minutes and 35, three minutes and 35 seconds. Three minutes and 35 seconds redacted, resume. understand that this action desk officer was trying to convince you to do? I felt he was trying to have me hang up. He didn't want to take the call. He wanted me to hang up. He kept me on hold for such a long time. And if you hadn't been a commission investigator, what would you have done? I would have done exactly that. I would have hung up. Are there any other examples? Yes, I do. I have another one. Can we, I'd like to ask that we play brief, that we play tape number two. What should an action desk officer have done in that instance? Well, in that instance, a, uh, the action desk officer should have, um, you know, tried to induce the complainant, complainant to give forth that information and gain the confidence of the uh, caller and tell the uh, caller how important it was for him to lodge that complaint and what cooperative effort we would have made to, to conceal his identity. Did the commission conduct any integrity tests in Spanish? Yes, we did. How many tests did you conduct in Spanish? Six. And what were the results of those tests? Uh, out of six times when I called um, on four occasions, they did not have anybody that would speak Spanish. 
that would take my complaint. As an example, I'd like to ask that tape number three be played. back the next day? Yes, I did. And what happened? They told me to call back the next day. Sergeant Weber, do people ever call the action desk who do not speak English? Yes, they do. And given that, what accommodations have been made to take information on the languages such as Spanish? Uh, we will try to utilize what available manpower we have on the tour <laughs> Uh, in this case, a Spanish-speaking officer who would attempt to uh, translate the, uh, ta the uh, conversation. And uh, are there times when there is no one available on a tour? It's, it's very possible that uh, it could happen. So there are no formal accommodations that are made? Uh, not within the purview of the, uh, and the confidentiality of the IED system. So what happens if someone calls the action desk with information about corruption who doesn't speak English? Uh, if there is an available individual who could translate it, we will, that we will utilize that individual. If not, uh, we have a serious problem. So in other words, in both the Internal Affairs Division and in the Internal Affairs Bureau, was and is at times incapable of receiving information about corruption from a large segment of the community of New York City? Well, we relied upon the... Uh, the, uh, the judgment and ingenuity of the uh, action desk supervisor to try to attain a translator. And if he couldn't, then he couldn't. Okay. As part of your investigation and audit, did you check on whether other commands in the department that receive complaints or information from the public have the ability to receive information in other languages? Yes, I did. And what was the result of that inquiry? I would like to refer to my notes at this point. Yes, that's fine. Okay, we contacted 911 and CCRB. They use the language line, which is a service by the telephone company, which provides them and hooks them up to a translator right away. I also called the Bias Incident Unit, the Organized, the organized Crime Investigations Division, Sex Crime Squad, and they all had a former system set up, when I had, which I had ac access to someone who spoke Spanish in 15 to 30 seconds. But what I, while I was placed on hold, I was urged to stay on the line. Did anyone ever urge you to stay on the line when you were placed on hold at the action desk? Never. Are you suggesting that the CCRB um, uh, has a, uh, an ability to do this simply through a service offered by the telephone company? I believe so. Is there some reason, Mr. Weber, why you aren't using it? Uh... The reason uh, we d do not use uh, outside sources outside the Internal Affairs Division 
is uh, because of the sensitive nature of the, uh, of the communications and the confidentiality of the uh, information that we deal with. Do you think they're any different in uh, magnitude than uh, the brutality complaints that come to the CCRB? Well, uh, the uh, magnitude of the brutality cases are, uh, are, are distinguished from the uh, sensitivity of a corruption case. They are in your view, apparently. Go ahead. Sergeant, doesn't the bias unit, the Organized Crime Investigations Division, and the Sex Crime Squad also conduct investigations of a confidential nature? Yes, they do. Sorry. Was there any thought ever given for the action desk officer to tell the caller to submit it in writing if they had difficulty in understanding one another on the phone? In other words, to know at least rudimentary Spanish or other languages to be able to say, uh, please send this in in writing? Well, we do not have an established uh, protocol where we ask the uh, individual to submit anything in writing. We might request them to, uh, to present themselves in person during a day tour, but there is no step procedure where we ask them to submit in writing their uh, complaints. So if a person uses a telephone to call in to attempt to give information about corruption and does so in some foreign language, such as Spanish, which there was a very large uh, population here in New York, it's just a question of luck whether the uh, officer at the action desk is able to speak Spanish. And if not, that information is just not taken. Is that right? It's very possible, yes. All right. Sergeant, how many complaints does the Action Desk receive about police officers through the Action Desk each year, approximately? I would say approximately 13,000. And how many officers are assigned to the Action Desk? Generally, uh, one sergeant and between two to three police officers per tour. So if they do the mathematics, that comes to about one call per investigator every one hour and 45 minutes. Are there other calls as well that they're getting at the action desk? Well, there's, there's calls not just of corruption. There are calls, complaints of, of administrative improprieties, uh, corruption of other city workers in the metropolitan area, and calls for assistance and general information. So approximately how many calls per hour would you say that these action desk officers handle? Per hour? I would say about uh, per, individ per individual officer. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, one, in, within one half hour, he will have one complaint. One complaint in one half one hour? One corruption complaint within one half hour. Is that a heavy volume of call, Sergeant? He should be able to handle accurately one complaint within one half hour if it's a corruption complaint. So would you say that the volume of calls explains the poor performance of the action desk? I would not say that. Sergeant, what kind of training do action desk officers get regarding how to solicit information from individuals contacting the action desk? Well, the Internal Affairs Division does not have a set training schedule or program for newly assigned individuals to the action desk. What kind of training do they get regarding the need to encourage individuals to provide information like your name or the identity of the police officer? Police officers generally rely on an acrostic called NYATWAI, which they use the basic uh, when, where, how, what, why code to solicit information. Beyond that, it's a personal uh, talent or a personal ability of the individual officer to solicit information. Well, is there any attempt to indoctrinate or train persons who are going to sit at that desk and take these calls to do so with maximum efficiency? The only... Uh, uh, the only stimuli to, to encourage officers to do that would be the, uh, the occasional review of those logs by superior officers and who occasionally point out the, uh, the fault of the log. But there's no indoctrination or training of any sort? There is no initial training of, uh, on the severity or the importance of uh, solicitating information beyond the rudiment uh, database entries. And would you say that in the majority of instances where the IAD receives information about corruption, it's through the action desk? I would say so. <coughs> Sergeant, 
Sergeant, you said before that all calls to the action desk are recorded, is that correct? Yes, they are. How often, during the 10 years that you've been a supervisor at the action desk, has a commanding officer of IAD ever reviewed those tapes to assess the quality <coughs> of the action desk's performance? Uh, no action desk supervisor reviews the action desk tape as a, a matter of procedure to uh, determine whether the, uh, the tape reflects the accurate uh, processing or the accurate taking of the log. And let's go beyond the action desk supervisors for a moment. What about the commanding officers of IAD or the chief of the Inspectional Services Bureau or anyone above supervisor? Has anyone, does anyone regularly review those tapes to assess the performance of the action desk? Uh, no commanding officer, executive officer, on a procedural basis reviews the tapes uh, of the action desk. During your years as a supervisor, did anyone inside or outside the department ever make inquiries about whether the action desk was operating effectively? No. If an outside oversight entity conducted periodic checks like that, what impact would that have on the action desk's performance? It would have a positive impact on performance levels. And that's never been done? It has never been done. Commissioner, I have no further questions. Thank you both very much. Excuse me. Uh, we'll recess now until uh, 1.15.